Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to book editor, turned agent, turned internet mogul, turned, well, I'm not really sure. I, I kind of lost track of him for a few years. And then, turned writer, J.E. Fishman. His first novel, Primacy. Stick around. I'm not only the president of the Joel Fishman fan club, I'm a former client. is recorded live before a studio audience that can type, but they can't write worth a damn, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I wasn't really sure about the right way to introduce today's guest, Joel Fishman. Ultimately, I opted to be straightforward, so here it is. I owe a good deal of my success as a published author to Joel Fishman. As my literary agent back in the 90s, he had a faith in me that was unflagging, and he was the kind of pit bull in negotiations that you were always glad was on your side, not theirs. My three biggest book deals and top three best-selling titles to date were all on his watch. I always imagined we'd grow old in the business together. So it was a tough day in St. Petersburg when Joel sold his agency and decided to try his hand at other things. Yeah, we drifted apart, and it took some time for me to develop another lasting agency relationship. And during that time, Joel tried his hand at several other things, including becoming a father. Imagine my surprise a few weeks back when my former agent showed up in the email asking to come on Mr. Media to talk about his first novel, Primacy. I asked to read it first, but that was just a formality. No way I'd say no to this guy. Primacy is really a fine first effort. The action is fast and furious, and its stars are both female, Leanne, the animal researcher, and B, the talking bonobo. Yes, Rise of the Planet of the Apes fans, this monkey talks, and it's purely a coincidence of timing that Primacy followed on the heels of a great ape flick. I highly recommend you read Primacy and pay attention to my good old friend, Joel Fishman. Joel, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, Bob, and thanks for the flattering introduction. You know, I appreciate the check that you sent. Uh, Joel, <laughs> a book about a talking ape the stars are both female. Fishman, I feel like I hardly know you at all. <laughs> well, let me tell you, it was not, uh, there were times when I questioned the wisdom of having uh, chosen to have a female protagonist, not because uh, from a commercial perspective it's a, it's a bad decision. You know, many people know that uh, the majority of readers are women, uh, although perhaps not the majority of thriller readers. Uh, but because it's it's tough to uh, to write about the opposite sex, and w one of the things that I found was that uh, a lot of the things that I'd written early on, the earlier versions of this character, were very self-conscious about her being a female. Unfortunately, I had the wisdom to cut most of that stuff out before uh, it saw the light of day. But it was a challenge. Um. Do you, do you write something like this, thinking that this would this would help to sell it as a movie? I mean, I know I know from experience that you can be a little calculating about you know the that kind of stuff, knowing you know what the value of different things is, or did it just work to telling the story that she be a, that this be a woman? I think you know ultimately you know, there 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 uh, I sort of wear two hats, and it, the, the the writer hat goes where the story takes me. Uh, the the sort of publisher hat uh, is more calculating, and as a as a publisher, I, you know, I had a couple of different novels that I had to choose from in terms of what I should bring out to the public first, sort of in a big way, you know, to bring into bookstores. Uh, and uh, this one, because it had what we would call an off the book page hook, meaning that there's something beyond reviews that might interest people. In this case, the subject of animal research and animal rights. Uh, it had that element to it, so so that was strongly in its favor, uh, and I like the fact that it had a, a, a female protagonist because a, a lot of uh, a lot of thriller writers, uh, I'm sorry, thriller readers are, are women, um, and there are probably more uh, male protagonists in thrillers than than there are uh, female protagonists. Although although uh, you know there are quite a few of both, uh, but this story just. It, it sort of is a feminine story because I think at, at heart it's a story about about love and connection and those are feminine values, 
and it works better uh, with a female protagonist, in my opinion. I, uh, I think I got about a third to a half of the way through the book, and I was immediately thinking, I was immediately casting the movie. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I was thinking, start off with a, like, a, like an Anne Hathaway who's, who's working in the lab coat, and you don't really see her, and, you know, she's kind of mousy, and then, you know, at a certain point in the story, the lab coat is off, she's, you know, kicking this guy in the nuts on the subway, and, <laughs> and suddenly you realize that, uh, you know, our little mousy librarian is just going to kick the crap out of everyone she encounters, and it becomes a very different story. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cool that way. It's very cool. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, th I think what happens, uh, you know, is when you, put a, you give a character a moral dilemma, and a moral dilemma, uh, you know, is a choice or a series of choices that is truly revealing of characters. Of character, and a lot of uh, uh, you know people when they think of character, character they they really think of characterization. You know, the person's in a wheelchair, the person has a limp, the person is is tall or short, or uh, you know, a former you know army medic or whatever. Those are all elements of characterization. But but really, the, what, where character comes out is when uh, there's a difficult decision to be made. Am I going to go quietly into this good night, or am I going <laughs> to fight my way out of this thing. Uh, and that's where you really, you know, you really get the, the depth of character. I'm glad to hear you mention that the movie thing, we do, we have not sold movie rights to this point, but I've had a lot of people tell me that they, they found the writing was cinematic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, which uh, I definitely took as a compliment. W was I the only one who was surprised that, uh, and, and I don't mean to infer anything, but w was I the only one who was surprised that uh, for your first novel that, uh, you know, you you're writing a, a female character. I was a little surprised by that. Needless. Oh, that's to say. fine. No, I haven't had anybody uh, comment specifically about about that. I mean, I've had people ask me about the the challenges of, of writing a female character as as a male, but I haven't had anybody uh, express you know shock that Fishman has chosen to write about women. <laughs> I was a little surprised. You see my macho side, Bob, as a, as a negotiator. You see, I keep that well hidden most of the time. Uh, okay, well, maybe that's it. Maybe it's that side of, uh, you know, that, that kind of threw me off. And then tell me about this part of it. Uh, talking monkey. I mean, that's like, you know, is that uh, Joel Fishman, J.E. Fishman, as you are now, uh, came up with a talking monkey story? I mean, I was, you know, that was the other thing that kind of threw me off. Well, that was really the, the genesis of the story. I was, I was, ever since I've decided to write fiction, you know, one it, in one's downtime, ideas float into into your head, and then you sort of test them over time a little bit and think, is is there a real story here, or can I see something unfold from from this premise, or is it is it going into a dead end? And I was driving around in the car one day, and for some reason I was just thinking about all these efforts that, that researchers and so on make, uh, fairly benign researchers, uh, with regard to trying to get animals to speak. And there have been some, some famous uh, apes that have spoken, parrots and uh, other things uh, that have spoken in, in one form or another, you know, sign language or pictograms or whatnot. And I thought, wouldn't it be ironic if an ape finally did sort of cross that barrier naturally, and of all places it it found itself in, a, in an animal testing lab, in a, in a place that essentially was hostile to its very being. Mm. And how would people uh, react to that? And I decided that it would be a, a pretty big threat to entrenched interests. That's a big industry. And people have their way of, uh, you know, there are many people who get a degree of their human self-esteem from the idea that we're better than all these other species. And so, uh, you know, if... if if Leanne, the, the researcher who discovers this ape, uh, just decides to, to uh, you know, to do nothing and just to accept that this poor thing is trapped in an animal testing laboratory run by people who are not looking out for its interests, uh, then, of course, there's no story. Uh, but if she decides to, if her character goes in a way where she is, uh, you know, willing to resist, you know, the, the forces that are arrayed against this, this chimp, then... Uh, then you've got the beginning of a novel, and in this case, the beginning of a thriller. And am I saying it right, Bonobo or Bonobo? Bonobo. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you had it right. All right, and folks, I got to tell you that uh, if if you watch the original Superman movie with Christopher Reeves and you believe that a man could fly, you will read this story and you will believe that a monkey can talk. <laughs> you know, 
Uh, what's the co- it, it, total coincidence, right, uh, that, that the Rise of the, the uh, Planet of the Apes came out uh, just a short time before this book? Yes, total coincidence. I started this book about three years ago. It's been on and off uh, effort for, for about three years. And I didn't have any idea that the Planet of the maybe I'm out of the loop, but I had no idea about the Planet of the Apes movie until about uh, two months ago when my publicist mentioned that this movie was about to come out. Uh, and um, I recently you know, ran out to, to see the movie because I figured people will ask me about it. And it's a pretty good movie. It's quite different. Uh, you know, I, I think you know, if, if you do a sort of a half-sentence description, it might sound like it, it's, it's similar. And the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the talking ape thing, obviously, is in, an inevitable comparison. But, uh, but it's quite a different story. And one of the things, one of the differences I, I really note, in fact, is this, this difference between, I think, the Planet of the Apes, uh, the most recent one, is a very male-oriented story. It's a male chimp. Uh, and uh, and the, the chimp's first act is, is really an act of resistance. And his, the, the chimp's first word in Planet of the Apes is no. Right. In, uh, in Primacy, the chimp's first word is Indeco, which is Lingala for brother. And, uh, and the perspective of Primacy is really a perspective of love. It was, uh, I think, it was incredibly good fortune that be, that there was a, an apes movie not being made, but that it turned out and it was a good movie, because it, I think it really whetted people's appetite for that type of thing. So I think if people can, people are find your book or hear about your book, if they were positively impacted by you know seeing that uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, this is a nice, uh, this is a nice fit. It doesn't, it's not the same story, but it does fit into that. Uh, I don't want to call it a genre, but there, there's a connection that you could make there yeah. if you liked one. Oh, absolutely. I think that if, I think people, it, it, the, the, thing, the big thing they have in common besides a, a talking ape <laughs> is I think they're both an exploration of, of uh, you know, humans' relationship with animals on, on some level and humans' place in the, in the universe or at least place in the world. Uh, and um, it, there's no question that it's fortuitous uh, that that movie not only happened when it, when it has... Uh, but that it's been a success and it's it's been a big hit and, and I certainly hope uh, if somebody walks into a, you know the book's going to be on uh, tables at the, the Hudson News chain and airport stores for example and if somebody sees that that you know book jacket with the title and the, the you know the premise and and the the ape image on it uh, you know that if they they feel like they didn't get enough from Planet of the Apes that uh, you know I hope they'll explore this book and uh, and uh, you know get a, a greater depth of understanding of of some of these issues. The only thing I was thinking was it would have been nice if uh, folks can see the cover here. We, we'll, we've already flashed it at the beginning of the show. If it had a little word balloon and and uh, uh, B was actually saying primacy, you know, a little cartoon kind of that would give. I it, think that that would that, that <laughs> might be that might be good for the parody version. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and how lucky were you that the movie didn't suck? Because that would have that would have hurt actually. I think. Be like, I mean, oh God! Oh, right. Well, you know, uh, you know, it, it's way too early in the process of the publication of this book to be counting my chickens, but uh, but there's no question that it's a, it's a bit of luck that uh, that the movie was was pretty good and as as successful as it as it's been. Now, I I gotta ask you this: the story uh, it has reading it has the potential to be very politically charged on one side or another. Uh, so I was a little surprised, uh, and I'm not giving away the ending of the book. But, but uh, an, an author's note at the end where you say the author is neither a scientist nor an animal rights activist. Why? I mean, I thought that was almost kind of a, a cop-out on your part not to you, – you've, you've, we've gotten – we've read this entire book, and I don't want to give away anything. But, yeah, I mean, it takes place – it starts in an a animal uh, testing facility. It's just way out of – gotten way out of a hand. And uh, you've made this great case. But then you—it sort of seemed like a cop out. We just kind of—you know—was it CYA or was it something else there? Well, I hope it wasn't CYA. It, maybe it was to the extent that I don't—I don't expect to, you know I don't wish anybody to portray me as an expert on these issues. I think that you know, with regard to the role of a novelist, uh, Milan Kundera had had a good line. Milan Kundera, the the, the, the famous uh, novelist, said that. Uh, it's not the novelist's job to provide the answers. It's it's the novelist's job to pose the right questions, and um, I think that you know on some level people with uh, with an agenda uh, on this issue on one side or the other, not none of them probably would be a hundred percent happy with me. The animal rights guys in this novel are uh, you know a little bit uh, uh, 
you know, skewed in a certain direction, shall we say. I don't want to also give, give too much of the plot away, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that the protagonist's uh, sympathy is not 100% with the animal rights people, even though her actions are uh, concordant with uh, the values of, uh, among other things, the primacy of the individual, which I think is, a, is certainly, a, a, you know, a rights issue. Um, uh, and the scientists, uh, you, you know, I, I think there probably there there probably is an argument, but you know, for some level of of uh, you know research on animals uh, you, that 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 is justifiable. But I, I personally do think, from the research I did for the book, that uh, uh, things are skewed way too much against uh, against the animals, and there's not a, a, enough of an acknowledgement that uh, you know, as the philosopher Peter Singer would say. Uh, you know that these animals have interests and they have the capacity to suffer. So, in 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 some sense, I started out you know being sort of neutral and I sort of wrote my way a little bit, uh, you know, more toward the animal rights argument uh, than the other way. But uh, largely because that's where the character took me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I didn't want to I didn't want to you know anybody to think I had really written this this book because I was staking out a political position. At the end of the day, it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. Well, you I mean you follow that line with information about PETA and another group, and I thought that was probably sufficient. But I was, just, I'm just telling you, I was a little disappointed that I got through this whole, you know, really cool story, really flowing action, and it, with a point of view, and the point of view is that neither side is necessarily right in this, which is fine, but then to say, you know, it's not a, I don't know, I, I just thought, if you go to a second edition, I take that line out, I guess is what I'm saying, Joel. All right, well, maybe, yeah, <laughs> I'll take it under advisement. You do that. You do that. It's about time you started listening to me instead of vice versa. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media interview with novelist Joel Fishman, author of Primacy. And we'll be right back. Hey folks, you can hear Mr. Media while on the go now with Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile app available for your smartphone, whether you use an iPhone, iPod Touch, Android, Blackberry Curve, or Palm Pre. And when you download Stitcher to hear Mr. Media today, you have a chance to win some real money. Downloading is quick and easy. Just find Stitcher in your smartphone's app store. Download it, it's free, take seconds, then during registration, hit the promo code box and enter Mr. Media, that's MR Media, to get automatically entered to win $100. The latest episode of Mr. Media will be waiting for you in Stitcher's Favorites right on your phone. You'll get access to lots of other amazing shows too, always available to you on demand, no syncing. Some of my favorites include WTF with Mark Marin, Plus One Per Diem with Kevin Smith, and The Nerdist with Chris Hardwick. It's all free and all instant to you on Stitcher Smart Radio. And don't forget to win the money. Enter promo code Mr. Media, MR Media, when you register. And thanks for listening. This is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media interview with novelist Joel Fishman, author of Primacy. So, uh, Joel, uh, you know, you've done all these other roles. You've been, a, you've been an editor. You've been an agent. Uh, tell us about the craft for you of becoming a writer full-time. Um, you know, when did you start writing fiction, and, and, and why fiction? Why not do, you know, uh, nonfiction or something else? I started writing fiction a, a long time ago, probably when I was... Ten or twelve years old, uh, and um, certainly in high school, I was I was writing some fiction, and I've always wanted to be a, a, a novelist, but I somehow never got around to it. And uh, you know, it was the old thing of go get a, go get a paying job, and and, and uh, you know, don't risk everything on you know on this, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, you know, I had some some business success recently, and we moved, and we sold the business, and. And I thought I'm not getting any younger, and, and 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 this ambition to write, you know, still nags at me after all these years. Uh, so uh, I finally decided to uh, to commit myself to it full time, 
and I think you do have to look at it as a job. And I, I sit at my desk every day and and, and, and write uh, when I'm not, you know, busy trying to publicize, uh, you know, the things I've already created. That is, uh, the 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 reason you know fiction versus nonfiction. Uh, you know, to some degree, I, I like to joke that that nonfiction deals with small truths, and fiction deals with big truths. Uh, but the the real the, the, what's that? That's that's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that it really is sort of the the the, you know, the 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 bigger human story, for some reason, can be portrayed uh, better, you know, in fiction. In, in nonfiction, people tend to you know bog down on the details. It's sort of like, uh, you know, going out into the weeds, and, and there's virtue in that for the proper story told by the proper person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I think that you know the bigger stories, the, the, the stories that reach into the human heart, uh, are uh, really uh, you know great fictional stories um, and uh, so uh, yeah and for me I, that, that's what I've always felt called to do I never considered myself I, I, I had worked as a journalist many years ago very briefly but I never you know being a good journalist is, is although some journalists certainly are very good writers is more about having a nose for news and really loving all those little details and loving getting that little story and for me what I love is creating something out of whole cloth and uh, and convincing people to buy into that story uh, enough to continue with it and and uh, hopefully to sit down afterwards for a few minutes and reflect on it and be moved by it uh, and uh, and just be moved to, to greater thoughtfulness by it. So that's what turns me on. That's it? I mean, if I asked Pam, would she tell me that maybe there were some other things that turn you on or maybe we should skip past that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> is that the only thing that turns me on you? But uh, I've actually turned out among other things by, by great food, but I, I don't write about food. Oh, okay, not yet anyway. You probably didn't write about apes three years ago. True enough. <laughs> so I, I wanted to ask you about where you write. And for uh, our, the audience that's listening to this on podcast and not video, uh, I'm assuming that the room we're seeing you in is your office. Yeah, that's correct. This is where I write. Um, I uh, have uh, on the bookshelf behind me some books that I've worked on over the years as editor or agent. I have, you can't really see, but the, the walls are covered by uh, book jackets, including yours, Bob. In fact, there's one, well, there's I one, see it. Up, yeah, there there's it one up here out of, out of sight, The Profit Zone by Adrian Slowatsky with Bob Andelman. Yeah, uh, and I, I actually, I see, I, let's see if I can point. Uh, folks, if you look right about where my finger is, that's built from scratch. The book I did with the Home Depot guys. There you go. Very nice. Right. So you know, I keep, I keep. These things remind me. You know, writing is a lonely, is a lonely craft. You know, it's 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 mostly just you and that and that keyboard. Uh, and uh, it's nice to be able to spin around once in a while and be reminded of of the of prior success, albeit uh, in you know wearing different hats. Uh, but I I have an office about uh, five miles from my house. It's important to me to. To make that transitional drive, I've tried working from home, and it, 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 it's not nearly as productive as uh, for me as uh, being able to just get in the car, go to a different place, and uh, I sit in this little office and uh, crank it out. It's funny after uh, uh, well, let's just say more than twenty years of uh, writing. Uh, I'm actually thinking that at some point it might be fun to have an office to go to. I've always done it at home, and. Uh, Strangely, I'm thinking when my daughter's out of high school, that might be the time to get an office, and I, I've probably got it backwards. But you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I think it's probably a better economic decision to stay at home. Like, why pay the extra rent? But yeah, you have to do what works for you. I don't know. Change change the scenery might be nice. Maybe I'll just come up and rent your rent your home office while you go off to the office, and I'll work at your place. Be a long commute for you. Well, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Uh, have you developed any rituals around writing? Do you have to have a certain, you know, cup of coffee, or, uh, or, uh, you know, are you a Mountain Dew fiend? Or do you, you know, you got to have your crumpets, or you know, what do you do in the morning? No, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, in some sense, ashamed to say that I don't have. Uh, you, you hear so much about writers who have a routine, uh, and where you know, they they write at a certain hour, or they write, they have to be in a certain place. I never had any of, of, of those things. In fact, I don't even necessarily write at the same time of day. Uh, the, the one thing I try to do is once I've once I've uh, started to write, uh, I try to be committed to it either for a period of time, usually three or four hours, uh, steady, uh, and or uh, a number of words, number of pages. Uh, I mean, the point being simply to to you know to sort of stay put and be productive for a chunk of time. 
uh, but I have not felt uh, up, up to this point, and, and, and maybe I would have produced more if I had, that, uh, yeah, but I haven't felt, uh, you know, that fit it into a rigid framework. Um, and uh, again, you know, maybe I should do that because at this point I, I really, uh, you know, now with this novel out there, are a lot of distractions around publicizing the novels, and I find the past couple of months uh, I haven't had a lot of time uh, to write, and probably I need to carve out more time because I've got I've got a, a ton of ideas and things that that I'm looking to pursue. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, uh, and I guess I'm asking this from my own experience, but has becoming the father of a young lady, you've got a ten year old daughter. Uh, has that uh, impacted your writing in terms of what you will write and what you won't write? I don't think, not too much. She, uh, you, you know, the great impact is my daughter is a big reader, and she writes all the time, a lot more than I ever did when I was 10 years old. And, uh, it, and she's one of my greatest fans, and it's really cute, and it's really encouraging to see you know, how much she just admires the whole concept of somebody uh, you know, creating stories and, and, and moving people uh, with stories. I think it's, one has to be careful not to, uh, you know, get sort of distracted by, uh, at least in my opinion, thinking about your, your writing for one person or, or, or writing uh, in the context that you don't want a person to read a certain thing so you won't write about it. Uh, you, you know, I think the sort of to my mind, like the sort of the, the sort of uh, famous thing would be to, oh, I don't want my mother-in-law to read this this sex scene, you know. <laughs> and I think you really have to distance yourself, uh, you know, from that because you know, yeah, I, I have a daughter, and I'll always have a daughter, but uh, she won't always be ten. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, if, if there are things that are not, uh, you know, she's not ready to read, and she understands that. And but but when when she's the the appropriate age, I want her to look at it and say, yeah, dad didn't pull any punches. Mm -hmm. Well, I, the reason I ask is that. The uh, sexual s scenes and imagery in the book, there are some uh, in the midst of things. They're, they're a little on the chase side. They're, they imply more than they show. And in, in, in my, my own thought over the years, and I've got a 15-year-old uh, daughter, and my thought really since she hit seven or eight was I've kind of reined in things that I might have written or said, uh, A, because I didn't want her to read them and, and, and you know skew her view of dad, but also – there's a certain pressure there in terms of the people who are around you when you have a daughter that age, uh, the parents of the other kids, you know, they read something right. that you might write and, you know, well, maybe they don't want to send their kid over to your house anymore because, you know, dad's written about whatever. And I just wondered if you were at all conscious of that. And I guess you kind of answered that. Well, you know, fortunately, I don't have any plans to write a novel about pedophilia. So, so I'm, I'm sort of safe as far as that goes. But no, I, you know, I think on some level there is what I what I do believe is is that um, uh, you know unless your subject say you know calls for explicit sex uh, or uh, or just you know gobs of profanity, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't have any problem with any of that any of that stuff. But I, I do think that that uh, uh, you broaden your market by uh, by not putting stuff in that could be, you know, gratuitously offensive to people. Some things, you can't worry about offending people if that's part of the, the, you know, the inherent truth of the story. Uh, but to offend people sort of egregiously with a parenthetic thing just because you needed a love scene, and I mean, there, there are a million ways to write a love scene, and they, you know, they don't have to, uh, a love scene doesn't have to be a sex scene, you know, so, um, so to my mind, I do think that, you know, I, I have, in fact, it's interesting you should say that because I, I, I do recall now, I set out Originally, I thought I was going to write this novel with no profanity and no explicit sex or no sex whatsoever. Um, and, uh, but that, that's too self-consciously chaste, you know, so, so I, I was trying to find, the, find a balance. Well, I thought, I thought it, it, it was handled well. I mean, you know, you have this couple that comes together and, they, I mean, they, 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 they come to, I don't mean they come together, they, but they, 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 they have a relationship that kind of blossoms through the course of the action and the story. And I thought it was handled well, and it was handled in a way that, you know, your ten-year-old could read and not not be, ooh, daddy, ick, you know, whatever. Right, but, that's uh, true. Well, I did I did write a, no a novel that was serialized called Cadaver Blues that was a mystery, and ironically, it's on the internet; anybody can find it. Uh, and there is a fairly explicit sex scene uh, in that novel, but the novel called for it. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I think you know part of you know, suspense of any kind, and you can have, uh, you know, sexual suspense as, as you know as well as suspense with the threat of violence or whatever it is. 
Uh, suspense is really about what you leave out, not what you put in. It's about expectation. And to some extent, uh, you know, the, the second that those, those guys were, you know, flirting around each other, you know, fall into bed with each other, there's a release of that, of that tension, and it's lost forever. You know, the will they or won't they, uh, you know, get, you know, is lost forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's also a little bit of a, you know, of a technique to string these things along, to, to give, give the reader uh, just one more point of tension. A more more point of suspense. So, Joel, let me ask you: um, What have you learned about being a writer now that you didn't previously know as an editor or an agent? It's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I think that there, there's a you know I, I've always had people tell me that I was a, a talented writer, um, uh, but I had not really sat down and committed myself uh, to it as a you know as a course of life, uh, and. Um, I think you know one of the things that you know uh, you know inherently when you sit you know in in the in the seat of a gatekeeper, whether it's a, as an editor or an agent, you know that there's a, a lot of stuff out there and that you get very impatient with with, with things that are not uh, you know executed at a high level, say what whether that's because the person doesn't have the talent or didn't put the effort in or whatever it is. And you know I, I think I've, I've learned that. Uh, you need to have the highest expectations for yourself, and you can't rush things. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't, you know, there, there's, there's a degree to which as a writer, you finish writing something, and immediately you want to show it to somebody. And the mark of professionalism is actually withholding it from other people for a while and trying to make yourself your toughest critic. And, you know, even then, um, uh, people are going to have feedback that's, you know, that's valuable, but uh, you don't want to show it to people too soon. And, and I think that's been the... Uh, the hardest thing to remind myself of. It's something I sort of knew from the other side, but um, uh, you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes into making something, uh, you know, appear polished, and, and you've got to create distance for yourself. And uh, so you need to be patient before you, before you share it with others. And the, the other thing is that once you've shared it with somebody, it's sort of like the horse has left the barn. You're never going to get the same read, even from a professional reader, uh, the second or third time as you got the first time. And it's important to, for, to to really make that first time count. I think that's a, an extraordinary point, and I'm not I'm not kidding with you. I really do. I think if the two of us had known that 15 years ago, it would probably done us both good. Uh, I I I that's something I I tell people. You know, if someone talks to me about writing or or being productive, I say patience is something I've really learned only in the last five to seven years. And uh, I'm still it's still a struggle to write something. You're very excited about it. And to hold it back and keep working on it. I always want to say, "Oh, look, 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 look what I just did! Look at it!" And, and you know, the reality is, you hold it back and you work on it some more, and it gets better. Yeah. Some people already know that, and you know, I guess that's right. us guys had to kind of learn that. Well, so you know, that's a you know, that you're right. I think some of it's temperament, and you have to sometimes fight your own your own temperament. Charles Bukowski has a great poem called "So You Want to Be a Writer." And, one of the things he says is that if, if, if you need to show it to your, your, your wife or your girlfriend or your, your mother, you're not ready. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and, and, because, and that, that will be your, the entirety of your audience at that point, too, if that's what you that's do. Right. So, uh, you know, we're just about to wrap up, but I've got to ask you, any regrets about giving up the literary agency? And please, just say yes, even if you have to lie. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I miss the interaction uh, that I used to have with my clients. I really do. Um, good answer, right? Yeah. But, you know, th on another level, I mean, I think it's, it, it's a really tough road to hoe uh, right now. There have been a lot of changes. Um, you know, it, as a writer, you hear no a lot. Uh, as an agent, you, you, you hear it uh, even more frequently simply because you're having to pitch that much more frequently. And... Uh, you know, it's a very tough business, and there are some people very good at it. Um, I was gratified that most of my former clients still, you know, even though essentially I betrayed them by, by leaving them, uh, you know, most of them still have warm feelings for me, which is pretty neat. Now, if I'd been their agent still for the, these intervening 15 years, whatever it is, maybe they would hate me at this point. I don't know. But, you know, I, don't, I, I, don't, I think that to some degree you can't live life with regret. And you, you, you make whatever decision you make and you move on and, you know, and, and you have to accept that that's just part of, uh, you know, the, the growth of your life. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll let it go. <laughs> 
But I I miss you, Bob. Yeah, I I know. I miss our banter. Yeah, there was plenty of that. There was plenty (laughs) of that. Well, uh, folks, listen. uh, You can find J.E. Fishman. I know him as Joel Fishman. Find his first novel, Primacy, in great bookstores everywhere. Uh, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Joel, uh, website, Twitter, Facebook, any of that kind of stuff you want to send people to? I have uh, I'm, I'm Facebook as Joel E. Fishman. I'm on Twitter as J.E. Fishman. Um, and um, the website is verbitrage.com. You can find me there as one of the authors. Okay. Very cool. That's where I'm at. All right. Well, listen, it was great to uh, have a professional oh, excuse me, opportunity. Excuse me, oh. excuse me, and Google Plus. You're I'm on Google also Plus. on Google Plus as right. J.E. Fishman. Put Joel in one of your circles. Not right. a circle of doom. Put him in one <laughs> of your good circles. Uh, Joel, uh, great to uh, catch up with you professionally, uh, a little personally, uh, on the side there too. And uh, thanks so much for joining us, Mr. Media, today. Good luck with the book. Likewise, Bob. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure.